you to our speaker, Jamie Harvey. Jamie Harvey is the Executive Director of the Institute for a Sustainable Future in Duluth, Minnesota, and is a nationally recognized prevention leader through his extensive experience at the intersection of healthcare and ecological health. For this work, he has been interviewed and cited in media, including Time Magazine, USA Today, Minnesota, and National Public Radio. In 2009, Jamie was awarded the National Thought Leader for his work on healthcare and sustainable food systems, and in 2015, the Paul and Sheila Wellstone Award by the Minnesota Public Health Association for Lifetime Achievement. He is the author on numerous health and prevention journal articles and is a contributor to the textbook Integrative Medicine. Jamie speaks and consults internationally, and we are honored to have him today as our speaker. Now I will turn it over to Jamie. Great. Thank you so much, Kim. Great. Thank you so much, Kim. I'll just wait for the slide to come up. Before I get going, I just wanted to share that um, there we go. Just wanted to share that I'll be speaking really at a 20,000 sort of meta foot level. And so if people have further questions um, and want some resources, I want to be clear that at the end of the talk, I provided a host of web links um, so that uh, attendees can follow up and learn more. Um, and um, those links should provide some, some further, further depth. And perhaps this 20,000 foot level conversation will allow for further conversations through the National Rural Health Resource Center. Um, but in any case, I just sort of want to get in right now and I'm excited and honored to be here today. Um, if there's really anything that I would hope to get across is that integrative health and medicine is um, are, are really three things. One is a systems model. So it focuses on interconnections and relationships, and some of the attendees may have heard about uh, mind, body, spirit, um, and and so we'll we'll delve into that. But at its core, it's a relationship model that looks at interconnection. Um, it's also very powerful for the healthcare sector because it provides a, a perfect and opportune pathway to connect individual health to the work that hospitals are involved in through the community health needs assessment processes uh, by linking individual, community, and planetary health. So really, as, as I'll, I'll, I can't emphasize more, it's an, it's an approach, it's a process um, that, that at its core is relationship-based. And because it's relationship-based, um, what you'll likely hear throughout this presentation is people and attendees get more familiar with integrative health and medicine. It's really qualitative because as we recognize more and more that health uh, is beyond sort of the biometric measures that we've used um, for the last few years, but it includes qualitative measures like empathy and how one, how one feels. So health is at the core how one feels. So you'll also hear terms such as the art and science of connection because integrative medicine um, weaves together art or feelings and the sense of connection, but as well the, the, the science that can be as high tech as one wants. Um, so the terms art and science, high touch, and high tech are all part of it. But again, integrative health and medicine is just an approach. It's a worldview. It's a way of seeing uh, connections with one's patient, with one's community, and with the with the planet. So um, as a bit of framing, I think it's important to step outside of healthcare. So I'm going to spend the next few slides just sharing a, a little bit of an example of some thinking that's happening again globally. And as we recognize that climate change scientists and even the, the Lancet is recognizing that climate change is the largest health threat of the 21st century with a whole host of human impacts from increased vectors and, and so forth. We know that the endocrine uh, society um, has been a leading voice at the global level, uh, raising a concern and alarm for the use of pesticides and other 
the toxic chemicals EPA, such as dioxin and PVP, uh, BPA and fluorinated compounds and so forth that have contaminated the wombs of organisms around around the planet. We also know that not only in the United States, but the we also know that not only in the United States, but the burden of obesity and chronic diseases is impacting the ability of health systems to deliver. Uh, to deliver very, very care um, in in uh, so very very dramatic back, ways. Step back and, and so what we step back, if we can step back and at the global level, uh, our planet is experiencing systemic inflation. And if um, we uh, we can see that at, even at the at the global level, our, our planet is experiencing systemic infla inflammation. And if um, if any of the attendees or anyone has had the opportunity to read last year's encyclical by the Pope or are familiar with the world of ecological economics, we start to understand that the world's problems cannot be analyzed or explained in isolation, and that, in fact, we are faced with one complex crisis. So what we are experiencing here within the crisis within health care uh, with, uh, with related to the burden of chronic disease or health care costs, we, uh, it's helpful to understand that this conversation is happening beyond health care and is included in economics and so forth. And so what we're beginning to appreciate is that globally um, we are moving from a belief system of, of a sort of a mechanistic worldview where we can sort of silo off our daily activities to really a systems um, worldview, and that's really at the core of integrative medicine. And really, if we're to be successful in creating health, um, we are going to have to adopt this 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 worldview. So it becomes um, and system a systems worldview um, is less dependent on hierarchy because in a system everything's connected. There's no top or bottom, and the value and the quality of the relationships become more important. And, and uh, for the so health administrators on this call, um, they likely uh, appreciate the work that's happening in the World Economic Forum, where even at the global business level, um, you start to see again these same, same terms. And so this is their latest report, the 2006 Global Risks Report, where uh, the business people are saying the global risks remain beyond the domain of just one actor and highlighting the need for collaborative and multi-stakeholder action. And so if we were to substitute the word global risks with the word health or healthcare, we start to see again a similarity with the types of thinking that is embodied within the integrative health and medicine world. And so it, um, it, it uh, again, uh, involves collaboration, multi-stakeholders, teams, and, and a movement away from hierarchies and, and control into, relation, uh, into collaboration. So again, uh, to emphasize, again, it, it, it's an approach. And so in this context of this great turning and, of, of, and, and what's happening in the business world and, without, and within the community and within the environment, world and so forth, we, um, we are working within the healthcare sector trying to address many of the needs of our patients, manage uh, the costs of healthcare delivery and so forth. And so um, we have uh, a model that we've uh, had now for the last, uh, what, 50, 60 years really ever since the Flexner Report um, was, was published. And and really embedded the uh, allopathic model into uh, into um, healthcare delivery within the United States, and clearly um, there are some uh, um, important strengths of uh, conventional medicine. Uh, for example, acute care and surgery and trauma care and diagnostics and so forth. Um, and so. Uh, the integrative health and medicine is, uh, includes many of these uh, many of these approaches, but it, it expands beyond um, beyond um, how we address and think about acute care and, and some of uh, and, con and conventional medicine. But we have some contexts um, that are helping us realize that we, we need new tools, we need, need new approaches. We know that diabetes and pre-diabetes will account for 10% uh, or so of total healthcare spending, likely uh, many of those on the 
call are experiencing that right now. And, and quite frankly, clinical interventions are just can't can't uh, keep pace. We also understand the science is telling us that um, pretty well, 60 to 70 to 80 percent of our uh, chronic diseases are a, a function of lifestyle and environment and, and nutrients and are, and are preventable. So it helps us understand then that the tools that we are going to have to adopt are related to lifestyle and upstream approaches and prevention. We also understand this was a study that was published in JAMA that up to 60 to 80 percent of primary care doctor visits are related to stress. And so again, reinforcing this notion of lifestyle and a need to focus on, on prevention. And the challenge, of course, is that many of the med schools, and though this is, this is changing rapidly, is that medical education has really been focused on, on the allopathic model and has uh, and the skill the, the training and skill sets that our clinicians have have not really yet caught up to uh, the type of uh, issues and concerns that the healthcare sector is facing today. So what I'll be sharing with you are tools and approaches that are going to be very very helpful. And so within uh, the Western uh, medical model. What ends up happening, of course, is that each individual becomes a diagnosis. So a person may be a cancer patient or a or a um, or someone with depression, versus a person in uh, an individual with a variety of different uh, different um, um, uh, concerns and have may not be reaching optimal health. But we silo people in into various disease categories and address address the diseases um, um, by uh, uh, trying to address their symptoms without really looking at underlying cause. So a large function of some of the healthcare costs that we're experiencing is that we have um, uh, um, not yet fully um, gone down the path of addressing root causes. And so but what we're seeing is that uh, huge percentages of the American public are using prescription drugs um, as a means to address some of these symptoms. Trying to address their symptoms um, and so really other things that have happened as well within so the last 10 years the ago that are really changing and revolution, revolutionizing clinical medicine and how we think about health are other areas in science. So, for example, and so what we're seeing excuse me, I had to take a drink. Research on the, on the microbiome is helping us understand that our gut bacteria has influence over a whole variety of, of so disease processes and is connected to our liver system and our immune system. And in fact, mental health is, is, a, is, um, is now understood to be uh, closely connected to our, our gut health. So it starts to throw our whole notion of how we think about um, um, individuals and, and, and disease process in the whole, on the ways that we never thought could, um, uh, could possibly be. We also understand this is uh, by the Minnesota Department of Health, but we see this, of course, um, in, in most states and is generally well accepted that clinical care or access to clinical care represents only about uh, 10 percent of our health outcomes. And it's, again, those environments or those systems around us which, which influence our health. Moreover, we, um, which is helping um, us understand we why AB 5 percent of physicians, this is according to the Robert Wood Johnson blindside study, said that patients' social needs are as important to address as their medical conditions. But as well, science, uh, the, I shared the example of the, mic, uh, of the microbiome, but as well, epigenetics itself just blossoming as a whole field of inquiry, which is helping us understand, though we've uh, spent a fair bit of money helping decode the genome, what is actually happening is with the epigenome uh, uh, is actually likely more uh, significant as it relates to our health and health outcomes. And epigenetics is really the study of how external influences such as stress or exercise 
exercise or nutrition or toxics and smoking can affect our gene expression, and these are heritable, meaning they can be passed down into onto future generations. So, so th this is science that can't really be ignored anymore, and in many ways helps us understand how uh, the social determinants is really may actually be a shorthand for uh, for epigenetics. It's really interesting then when we start to think about the mental health crisis that is facing our country to think about nutrition and, and healthy food and that if we don't start uh, uh, influencing the dietary uh, environment of pregnant women, it, um, uh, we may not be able to uh, effectively address the mental health crisis that we're seeing in this country because, again, we know through epigenetics that um, uh, we can actually start to prevent mental health problems by targeting the intake of pregnant women. We also know studies now are helping to demonstrate, again, this is epigenetics, how meditation and the relaxation response, which I'll be speaking about a little bit more, is um, able to, within a couple of hours, change um, change our metabolism and insulin secretion and uh, infl uh, inflammatory pathways. So meditation itself is is now been demonstrated to have uh, the scientific basis behind meditation is is now becoming firmly established. So all of this has been happening in the last 10, 15 years or so with increasing evidence, helping us think that we need to think of a new way um, that that um, that not only helps um, uh, address the symptoms in the patient, but but more importantly goes to the root causes. And so the science and our our our, our approaches is moving towards thinking about root causes, which um, which um, are expressed in symptoms. But unless we address root causes, we're just papering over over. Uh, that, the underlying that, cause. That and this is where it becomes very exciting uh, because we can really change the health status of, of individuals and um, the health of our health of our communities at the same time. But what that really means is to uh, is that we have to understand um, uh, our patients as individuals, and we're not all 150-pound uh, white males, for example, and that we metabolize metabolize our prescriptions in different ways and were influenced by external events in different ways. So um, integrative health and medicine um, is an approach that really is um, health and the health and medicine for the 21st century. I see I've dropped the C here. Um, but health and medicine for the 21st century. So it's really an expanded uh, it's, an ex it's an expansion of sort of allopathic medicine. It doesn't throw out its tools, but includes those tools in a whole new suite of, of, of uh, in a whole new toolkit. But again, at the core is understanding that we are individuals, each of us, uh, with different physiologies. Um, and, and whole systems of a mind, body, and spirit within the context of our community. So again, it's a systems way of uh, thinking or a systems of approach. So what were uh, some of the text has been lost there? But um, but what so what we've been seeing over the last ten or fifteen years is an increasing uh, um, uh, a profound shift in uh, in um, appreciation for um, a holistic approach or integrative approach. So the Institute for Functional Medicine, the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, the Academic Consortium, um, and I'll touch on these in a few minutes, um, are, are, um, are, are um, becoming sort of focal points for uh, um, this, this expanded body of wisdom. But again, I think at, uh, I just want to touch on, and these are different models. What we're starting to see again is a sort of circular or holistic model, where at the core of of our thinking about uh, our patients and and really our communities are those influences of environments or of the types of toxics we're exposed to, um, whether um, uh, or um, and 
and our and our relationships but and again, our security and purpose and community all influence our health and well-being. So it becomes, in some ways, a lifestyle. Some people use the term a lifestyle approach, but at the core is that we have to understand all of these uh, issues are integrated and influence our our health outcomes and our uh, and our health. Um, I do also want to point out that we're starting to see again, and I'm not going to, um, um, and I wanted to elevate this, that again we start to move towards qualitative approaches. So one sense of relationship uh, becomes very important into how our health is expressed. Um, this, and that slide uh, was a slide from the Center for Spirituality of the University of Minnesota. And for anyone on this call is interested, they've got great handouts and resources and uh, a wealth of knowledge that can be very helpful for those who want to learn more. The Wheel of Health, even the Veterans Administration is moving out um, an integrative model, and this is what they call their Wheel of Health. Um, and they are bringing acupuncture and mind-body stress reduction uh, um, and uh, seeing how um, these approaches have been very beneficial, especially around PTSD, but more broadly it's shifting how um, some of the health, training and thinking is going within the VA. But again, what you'll see, though, it might be called um, the wheel of health versus the well-being model. What we're seeing is that, again, we are putting the individual at the center and surrounded them by how um, relationships influence their health, their ability to have good sleep, nutrition, spirituality and their connection to a higher being or a sense of uh, a sense of higher power all of these um, work together um, and manifest in in in, in health uh, the British Medical Journal did a study uh, uh, just uh, what two months ago and again within Europe they're calling this the dynamic model of health but again what we're starting to see that uh, it's a really resiliency model uh, that is embedded with the integrative, broad sort of integrative health and medicine. So again, integrative health and medicine is really an approach that reaffirms the importance of the relationship between practitioner and patient. And some of uh, some of the those on the call might be familiar with motivational interviewing, which is again a different. Ter uh, uh, it's something that's been well recognized with the integrated health community for the last 10 to so, 15 again, we, years, uh, but really how one approaches the patient as a partner in, in the, um, in, uh, in, in the uh, healing process, I guess. Um, and it focuses on the whole person, is informed by evidence, and makes use of all appropriate therapeutic and lifestyle approaches, healthcare professionals and disciplines to achieve optimal health and healing. And so I'm not going to really delve into all of these, but that can in include um, um, uh, naturopathic medicine, it can include acupuncture, and it can include aromatherapy, or it can include um, different uh, lifestyle, uh, other approaches. Um, but it's, um, um, and so, so again, it's, it's an expensive tool toolkit that the clinician then has for their patients. Um, and it becomes actually very exciting and, um, and empowering because it reinstills the art and medicine for uh, those clinicians that have felt it has been lost. Key principles of integrative health and medicine, again, are optimal health as a primary goal. So that means that even if someone is sick, they can, um, they can, or uh, they can um, be resilient with that. And so um, it's not to avoid um, death, if you will, um, but it's how one lives uh, with with the assets and improves the assets that was have, so you can live optimally. The healing power of love uh, that um, is a key tenant and it's something that we shy away from in, in talking about this in, our, in society but at the core of this is how one um, treats and cares one another um, and especially the within the clinician and clinical uh, relationship. Wholeness, we've again touched on that, thinking of individuals as uh, a ref their health as a reflection of mind, body, and spirit. Um, it's a focus on prevention and treatment, so it's not just treating the symptoms but trying to understand the 
root causes and looking upstream as to how to mitigate um, some of the extenuating uh, uh, influences. Integration of various healing systems, so again, energy medicine, nutritional medicine, and uh, spiritual medicine, all of these all these types of healing systems, recognizing that we all have an innate healing power. And so um, empowering the patient to be, um, uh, and their, their innate abilities, so it changes the dynamic, the power dynamic within relationship. And in individuality, again, understanding that we're all, uh, uh, we're all unique all individuals, and 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 uh, that we have many learning opportunities. So whether it's, it's um, uh, whether uh, even the process of dying can be a learning opportunity, and it's part of the natural cycle of life. Of, of life. So again, it's a reaff uh, collectively. These principles are sort of a reaffirmation of of, of people. It's a, a sort of saluted genesis model and understanding that we are so um, sentient beings and, and um, that we're intimately connected by relationship um, to one another as human beings, but also within relationships to our community and the systems, be they food systems or educational systems, uh, transportation systems, and how they all influence our, our health. So I'm going to shift, and, and I just, you know, again, I, I wanted to understand and uh, emphasize this, this approach and role because um, it, it, sh it shouldn't be uh, 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 easily disregarded. And um, so I've thrown a couple of, 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 of uh, journal articles in here, uh, uh, citations in here. Um, and the so literature is filled with them, but when you, just, for example, you know, again, look at social support and cardiac death rates, we, uh, we know that uh, the study showed how patients who are most oppressed had the highest cardiac death rate, which is perhaps not that surprising, but perhaps what is more surprising is that the effect was negated when people felt socially supported. And so the more social support you have um, can influence uh, your death rate, the cardiac death rate. Uh, connection to the common cold. This was published in JAMA. Um, geez, when was that? Uh, 15 years or maybe oh, 20 years ago, when they looked at the, and they asked uh, uh, some volunteers who were given a uh, uh, rhinovirus, and they were asked about their types of relationships and relationships to one another with their parents, with their community groups, and so forth. And those who had the least amount of social connection or the lowest connection. Uh, developed cold symptoms uh, four times more frequently. When they looked at so, that, that so the role of relationship and connectedness plays um, uh, a very interesting um, a role in, in our outcomes. So again, speaking to the role of relationship and health. Again, this is, in some ways, you might call this motivational in, uh, interviewing, but it's really the power dynamic that one has with one uh, with one patient, whether it's, it's um, you you work to solve the problem together and assess where the patient is able to best make changes. But those who where where um, their patients see their physicians as a partner in this change versus uh, sort of controlling the dynamic, their patients have better outcome. Um, and so this was in the cancer prevention control, but patient uh, improved outcomes and patient anxiety, symptom improvement, and, and blood pressure control, and so forth. And and this was a, uh, an interesting study done by David Rakel down at University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. And where um, he trained, um, uh, he had an actor train some uh, clinicians on how they might uh, appear uh, non-empathetic and uh, through facial expressions and so forth. And, and, and he was, had uh, patients an um, who were treated by the these different uh, patients with different uh, empathy, and, and those who had the most empathetic um, relate, um, um, a visit with their patient, had the severity and duration of their cold um, was, uh, 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 was reduced relative to um, no visit, or and those who were non-empathetic actually had worse outcomes than if they didn't see the patient at all. So again, how you are, how you perceive how your uh, clinician treats you again has um, uh, has a relationship to one's health outcomes. So. Um, so um, 
Again, we, we could have an hour-long presentation on, on sort of relationships and health and so forth, but I just wanted to emphasize those because I think they're often uh, miscounted in our, in our sort of our, our busy um, um, within, within the healthcare sector and sort of the busyness that, that, um, that, um, that it brings. So integrative medicine has a variety of, uh, it's really an approach with benefits. It focuses on uh, resiliency from the cellular to the planetary level. Uh, it's effective for prevention and treatment of diseases, and the therapies typically have multiple benefits for safe, practical, and health sustaining. So whether it's acupuncture or whether it's nutritional counseling um, or uh, um, they, again, uh, have a variety of health benefits. There's a wide array of treatment options. Again, uh, the toolbox is much bigger uh, for the clinicians. Um, that there's a relationship, the relationship is more of a collaboration. And what we're seeing are, are clinicians that are just really energized because um, they are um, excited by the science because once you see these interconnections, it can become, uh, it can become pretty tricky. So it um, stimulates the, the clinical mindset um, that um, and what that we're seeing um, are, are is intrigued by the science and and um, and and but it also brings in the the art of, of medicine. So there's benefits benefits to also to your clinicians, but also benefits to the patients. And I have a link to this at the at the end of the talk. Um, but again, this is a great synopsis of the efficacy and cost effectiveness of integrative medicine. Uh, um, and this is a nice summary in this brave wall collaborative report. But again, increased patient satisfaction and retention. We're seeing pain management, decreased pain medication needs. And I'm going to couple, share a couple of examples in a few minutes. Uh, decreased pre and post operative anxiety, improved engagement in patient self care. So patients want to become more uh, involved in, in their self management. It's a way that patients become uh, and feel um, feel empowered. And so, um, and and so, uh, we are seeing sort of the efficacy of of the cost efficacy. And so, again, um, more broadly. Um, uh, we are seeing how changing lifestyle could, uh, again, prevent significant amounts of, of, of heart disease or uh, within um, were de uh, were, um, uh, studies, the state hospital study at the, done by the Preventive Medicine Research Institute were able to avoid cabbage because of lifestyle interventions. And so we can see significant uh, savings per patient um, on lifestyle approaches, but again, one has to have the skill set and appreciation for how upstream and preventative approaches can influence um, influence outcomes. So again, it's uh, uh, we can start to see some of these savings if one has the skill sets or really the training to see that. We're seeing uh, increased patient satisfaction. Uh, HF scores are higher when patients receive integrative services. Uh, patients who receive integrative health and medicine services for pain feel it was improved and so forth. And I'll, I'll share some more of these studies. And I'm going over these quickly because my sense is that um, uh, it's helpful for you to sort of sit back and, and sort of um, find some of these sources in the literature because um, uh, through these citations, then they'll sort of lead you on a pathway. But again, I just wanted to uh, provide um, a, a broader overview. And so what we're, what we're seeing is uh, widespread use. 42% uh, of all the hospitals in the U.S. offer integrative services. Use of integrative health and medicine is as high as 90% for certain paper, uh, patient populations. And, and some of the more common conditions that are being successfully treated are chronic pain, GI disorders, depression, anxiety, cancer, and stress. And so, so what does that look like? Uh, and um, I'm um, less familiar with uh, examples in the rural health. Um, community, but in the uh, larger health systems across the United States, almost uh, it, it would not. It's, it's common now to find in an integrative uh, department 
or um, a full system-wide um, uh, approach that's incorporated throughout the system. So, for example, Alina Health um, now has integrated medicine physicians, they have functional nutritionists, they have acupuncturists, biofeedback, health coaching, massage therapy, spiritual direction, mindfulness training. And um, Courtney uh, Baker, uh, a uh, cardiologist who runs the uh, uh, runs their um, integrative program, spoke at uh, a conference that I host every year in Duluth, and and uh, her full presentation is available there at that uh, at that link. So again, what you're seeing are major health systems that are bringing in a whole cadre and bringing in a sort of team-based approach to thinking about um, their various patients. So, for example, the Cleveland Clinic Center for Integrative Medicine has integrative medicine physicians and wellness physicians and holistic psychotherapists and massage therapists and acupuncturists and Chinese herbalists and using biofeedback and so forth. So, again, the toolkit, the toolkit is just expanded in a really exciting um, and, and uh, dy dynamic dynamic way. This was a study so, that was yeah, uh, that was uh, uh, published in the uh, Journal of National Cancer. Uh, uh, it was in a monograph, dy um, but was um, uh, uh, at the Alina system was, uh, uh, where they found uh, anxiety was decreased, cancer pain and anxiety. So therapies were, such as acupuncture puncture and massage reduce self-reported pain levels by 47 percent and can cut anxiety levels by 56 percent. So if we convert that into value and decrease uh, potential decrease pain payment, we start to see not only um, cost savings but also um, we convert that into patient satisfaction and um, just generally health outcomes, which is sort of a sweet uh, confluence of outcomes that one would want. Uh, the Alina program, Alina has uh, an, an, uh, a resiliency training program, uh, eight week long based skills based uh, program, where they bring in a psychiatrist, nutritionist, and uh, 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 in sort of a mind-body stress reduction, and what we're starting to see are improvements in quality of life and, and uh, reduced um, uh, and really improved productivity and so forth. And these 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 outcomes last, um, uh, you know, up to a year beyond the training program. So what uh, what integrative health and medicine offers are new tools and techniques. Uh, beyond the sort of um, conventional um, um, toolkit to um, really improve self-efficacy and, and the health of individuals, health of um, employees, and so forth. I don't know if any of you uh, on this call are familiar with Promise. Um, it's, uh, it's a um, it's a uh, program that was developed by Health and Human Services, I don't know if any of you, uh, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's uh, patients can report their health outcomes. So it's really a, it's a sort of a quality, qualitative, um, 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 uh, qualitative uh, pro uh, way to uh, uh, measurement program that um, that looks at um, that looks at physical, social, and emotional health. Um, and it's validated and 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 um, can connect into your uh, uh, epic program and, and medical and uh, record programs. But it's it's something that the Cleveland Clinic is using and uh, to see how how their uh, their program um, compares uh, with respect to patient evaluated scores. So. Uh, this was uh, uh, shared at the Integrative Health Symposium in New York, and you can go to their website and, and see this presentation. But looking at physical health for patients who came in with initial promise scores of less than 45, and those mean more ch uh, patients with more challenging issues. Looking at physical health for patients who came in with initial promise scores of less than 45, and those mean more challenging issues. Worth a worse uh, health status. Um, Doing lots of ums there, um, um, and so when they compared their family medicine program to the functional medicine program uh, patients, I think there was 
Um, and then of and about so 200 and 250 or so in each, but um, the patients reported improved or much improved 28% uh, through the family medicine program and using the functional medicine, which is an integrative model, 38% uh, improved or much improved. And similar uh, differences in, in mental health uh, uh, as it relates to the differences between sort of conventional approach or an integrative approach and and um, what's exciting is that they are keeping track of, of the cost uh, for patients so shortly we should be able to um, at, at a minimum what we're seeing is improved of value um, shortly we should do this uh, promise scores and uh, likely see over time uh, improved cost um, so it, it's really exciting the type of measures that are being put in place to um, build up the literature um, around around this work. The next three slides, I'm not going to delve into. There's a lot of text. Uh, these are some uh, abstracts that were uh, presented at the recent uh, international conference of integrative health and medicine in Las Vegas. But to show that uh, we can reduce pain through the delivery of integrative medicine. But to show um, that, uh, and so this was um, uh, with medicine. with significant cost savings, a thousand so per thousand dollars per hospital admission. With, with hospital costs cost lowered by about five percent per patient to report reported pain changes. This was down in the lineup. We can see that um, a multidisciplinary integrative medicine team uh, has um, uh, effectiveness on the, uh, chronic low low back pain. We can see uh, major depression is treated with yoga twice a week. Um, um, we can see as an adjunct of pharmacological uh, treatment uh, or yoga alone. And so we have different tools in our tools uh, in our toolkit that 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 can really help us out. So I'm gonna. I'm going to shift here for a second, and, and when I started this so presentation, I, I referred to sort of a community approach, and, and when we understand that a significant um, when amount of our health is is an influence of what help happens outside of our hospitals and the clinics, um, um, we start to appreciate that we are not going to solve our uh, the healthcare crisis that we have, the burden of chronic disease, and the economic costs that hospitals are are facing without um, working uh, outside in the community. And so, I just sort of wanted to shift. Uh, the conversation now to um, in integrative thinking or an integrative uh, systems model uh, within the community, and and hopefully uh, um, uh, it will we, we can see how integrative medicine the clinical level connects to the work that's happening in community uh, in in community, and so um, just as a quick background, I'm involved in a thing called the Creating Health Collaborative, and for the last three years we've been. Uh, getting together and publishing these what we call the emerging principles for health creation. And we've uh, brought players from the UK and Mayo and, and Kaiser and um, uh, the Netherlands and, and where some New Zealand and so forth. Um, and uh, done some publishing in Stanford Social and Review. But what we're, we're sort of, in some ways these are self-evident and in other ways, certain, they're perhaps an important reminder. But if we are going to sort of create health, um, uh, there are a variety of principles that we we must uh, broadly appreciate as a society. And, and we'll see a, a connection to these um, to sort of the integrative model from the standpoint of um, of sharing power. <laughs> measuring what matters, power. meaning don't only use biometric <laughs> models, matters, embrace complexity, meaning models, taking the systems approach, and so forth. But what we, um, but, but at what the we, core of it is um, that we have to let the community the define what matters, matters, and we have to operate at the matters, individual and community levels. Individual and what that means, of course, is that what the what community, means, course, what what the, what, the what matters to the community is not only how a healthcare system might measure health through biometric measures, you know, hemoglobin A1C levels or blood pressure and so forth, it's really how they feel. And um, for those health systems on the call that are involved in, in the community health needs assessment, they are likely seeing this. And I think it's really exciting to see the types of conversations that are evolving now through these CHNA processes. 
and um, I was that one that our uh, health systems in our community uh, hosted um, a couple of months ago where the community members, what they shared were their two hot, uh, top needs, at least in the meeting that I was at, was their um, need for diversity training within the school system and for livable jobs with um, meaning uh, jobs that paid adequate amounts so that they could bring uh, those in the room or that expressed this interest could uh, bring you know uh, food home onto the table. And so clearly, um, and so diversity training in schools and livable jobs aren't directly the responsibility of a healthcare institution. And we start to see again that, that um, or what, what we experienced was a sort of disconnect. And, and, and it's like, how does one connect sort of qualitative and quantitative measures? So there are two different languages that were happening there. But what we also start to understand is that we need some sort of collaborative process and approach. And really, even in the CHNA processes, many health systems don't yet have the schools skills and tools to be able to engage with the community and build the type of relationship that is collaborative um, in the same way that um, many of the clinicians that have been trained in sort of the old school do not yet have or are, are, are recognizing that they need to develop better collaborative approaches and so forth. So if one imagines our community as a patient, we can apply integrative thinking in the same way. And so how does one empower the community and how do, how do um, health systems and community work together to address um, the various issues that come up? And when we know that our individual health is a function of relationships, so our sense of place where we work, live, learn, and play, we can start to, again, apply integrative thinking. So that really our, our next health system or our whole person or integrative model of health is understanding the context um, that surrounds individuals and that hospitals and the healthcare community can be strong leaders in helping um, elevate the notion that, that uh, the quality of life is as um, important as many of the biometric model measures that the healthcare system is, is used to having an, an empowered community and individuals ultimately is going to result or likely result in better better health outcomes. So the approach that one uses um, uh, at an individual level or a clinical level is really the same um, uh, that that will be effective in, in working with the community on addressing uh, community health needs. And to think that um, any one person can do it alone and to think that uh, it's a false notion. So that how do we develop a team-based approach a false at the, so at the clinical level to help our patients and or think about a team-based approach with even competing healthcare systems or business community, or think about school systems, or support at the community level because <coughs> we're going to have to change the influences that are happening out in community. So again, <coughs> what we're, we're doing uh, within clinical medicine through integrative health and medicine so again, and actually beyond doing as we address community needs is creating a new health operating system that and actually beyond um, uh, puts into uh, a, 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 a better relationship quality uh, versus a strict quantitative into, approach. It's more collaborative, it's empowering, quality, and really requires an open mind and open will and open it's heart because it's um, because when really we work in complexity, an open um, and this is really what we're working because, at, there are no um, experts. And so we, uh, we need to access the tools that um, can help really um, address that upstream no needs and, and so, clinical needs uh, we as need well. To access the tools and so I'm going to um, just summarize some of this, and um, I'm not sure what we may want to do for Q&A after this talk, but um, after this slide, there's a whole variety of, maybe I'll just run through them, a variety of links and resources and so forth. I'll, I, I can maybe I can quickly summarize. But if, if uh, I was trying to imagine um, um, how one might introduce an integrative uh, medicine or an integrative med health and medicine in rural hospitals, and, and I think at the core of it, one has to think about the approach. How does one work with one's employees? Um, 
Uh, are you developing sort of employee teams? How does one think about collaborations and so forth? And I think the the uh, the business community is helping shift teaching um, and helping us understand that that traditional hierarchical model just is is not um, necessarily as effective at building a a healthy and vibrant and resilient workforce. And so um, so how one approaches um, our colleagues within uh, the work environment, but also our, um, with at, the, at the clinical level is, is vital. But it's also an approach that one, um, I think, is helpful to consider when working with the community, and I'll keep bringing up these community health needs assessments, is that um, clearly healthcare understands health in ways that others don't, but they typically think of it from a quantitative approach. And so um, I think it's important to work with an open mind and w ways to think of new types of measures for health when working in, um, uh, and again, with, within your community. And so what are your assets? I think typically what we're finding is that, you know, as I've shared, 70% or so of the American public is looking for integrative and is using integrative modalities. What we uh, are learning as well is that there are a whole variety of clinicians that are going off and getting training because they're excited. They're excited by uh, sort of this broad spectrum of tools that they can use. And so it might be worthwhile to assess what's going on within your own hospital. And I think it's important to recognize that Many of your uh, clinicians uh, may be actually uh, incorporating some various modalities and approach in, into their practice, um, but may not feel empowered to share these or feel, um, you know, nervous for whatever reason um, or. Um, and, and so what one might do is just do an assessment, and you'll likely see this in, in sort of the pain, pain management world, um, uh, but nursing and so forth, um, stress reduction, but my guess is that in almost every hospital um, in the country, there are clinicians there that have uh, uh, have a uh, keen interest and have um, done some self, uh, some training to um, um, gain new knowledge around these these practices, and uh, by doing an assessment, one might then um, see that actually there's a strong interest that has just uh, been sort of under the radar screen, if you will. I think the role of healthy food and nutrition is absolutely vital when it's so connected to chronic diseases, but that goes beyond strictly um, uh, healthy from a nutritional perspective. The role of pesticides and, and toxics and so forth clearly play into an integrated model. And so um, this can become an education. Hospitals can change their the types of food that they serve, um, and there's a whole toolkit um, available out there for uh, uh, for hospitals that not only want to sort of practice what they preach uh, with respect to shifting their the types of foods but also being um, being uh, um, champions and um, helping educate their community um, around uh, sustainable food, because sustainable is a holistic model, um, and that the science is showing that we can no longer ignore the fact that a lot of the inputs into uh, the industrial food model have inputs uh, onto individual health. And um, as well, when one looks at um, whether it's social determinants, um, my guess is that um, the rural health community suffers, um, uh, has patients that suffer significantly from loneliness and, like the rest of the country, pain and stress and depression. So explore um, the many tools available out there, mind, body, stress reduction, meditation, and so forth, uh, Tai Chi and yoga, explore what might be in your community, massage, and so forth that um, play important roles in addressing some of um, some of these um, some of these um, uh, some of these issues of loneliness pain stress depression and so forth and again this food gets back into it because when one looks at the role of food and health and nutrition as it relates to mental health it's absolutely imperative um, that food be connected to to mental health issues as well there's some powerful 
powerful, powerful uh, work going on around group visits and how group visits become very empowering to the patients themselves. And, and the side benefit is that there's actually some uh, often cost savings to the healthcare system. But training for the uh, for your clinicians and how to do the group visits um, and and how to code for them and and so forth is is important. But I think what evolves out of group visits is an uh, empowered sense um, of a community and and really the types of relationships that we pretend don't exist or have traditionally pretended don't exist and that are so vital for health. Um, so again, uh, something worth considering. Um, I think I already touched on this, but what I meant by collaborative community leadership demonstrating skills uh, when working with I community and in community. And there's a whole toolkit of training around collaborative leadership and hosting and engaging communities around uh, using tools such as World Cafe, a World Cafe, and Proactive Cafe, and Active Listening. There's a suite of tools out there um, that the healthcare community um, might, might benefit from to better um, help emerge the wisdom from the community as it relates to some of the underlying uh, drivers of poor health status in the communities. And then finally, as one's thinking about hiring and training and teaching, um, as one starts to um, train or hire, and um, where, where, where and who are you hiring from? What are their credentials? Have they had are they involved with a holistic where, medical, where, a nursing association, or, or have some institute for functional medicine training, or American Board of Integrative Health and Medicine diplomats, or who? What is the mindset? So, in your hiring practices, whether they have specific credentials or not, what is the mindset that they're bringing to the institution? And then, what is the ongoing training? My guess again is that you have many uh, clinical. Um, uh, perspectives uh, that are integrative uh, in nature that can provide in-house training for for uh, your colleagues and so forth. And so um, my sense is that there are actually a lot of assets to build from and a whole variety of resources that can be accessed for anyone in the in the in the rural health community or or beyond to help start moving integrative or uh, more expansive model into their healthcare system. So I'm going to breeze through these, and I think we might have room for a few questions. But these are just some organizations and fellowships and trainings for the Duke program. It is great for so perhaps for for lead healthcare leadership. Brings um, helps to provide some training in the areas of health and medicine. Um, I am for us in grave medicine for the underserved. It has a conference coming up.